Way to start your 2024. It's a good time to remind you about tomorrow evening, Sarit Santa, parking lot C. So what's happening at parking lot C? There'll mm. be tables set up. There'll be red and burgundy everywhere. The colours will be colouring and love will be loving mm. tomorrow. Mm. And if you've not bought your tickets, you still have time. Between now and tomorrow, 6 p.m., go to www.ticketsasa.com and purchase your tickets for the Elegance in Love cocktail dinner that's happening tomorrow at Sarit, your city. It is Valentine's Day, after all. So, show up with your significant other. Show up hoping to find love. Or show up with your very important significant other. Mm. You would have bought tickets for 3,000, 5,500, and 10,000 shillings. Wahoo! And nameless will be singing my sweet love where, where? things like that <laughs> do it tomorrow <laughs> let's uh, you know <laughs> they ask how will you know uh, that's how you will know that's how you know mm -hmm. at a nameless wahoo <laughs> We're nameless. And wahoo. <laughs> nameless or wahoo? Mm. Uh, wahoo. Wahoo. Okay. We're nameless. <laughs> wahoo, wahoo? We're nameless. Wahoo, nameless. We're nameless, uh, wah? wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> they will be there. Yes, yes. Ay, sour bassy. Mm. How much again? Are you going alone? Single, alone, singular. Single, alone, singular. Five. 3,000 3, shillings. Okay. Single, alone, with somebody. Yeah. 5,500 shillings. Single alone with somebody superior, yeah. 10,000 shillings. Otherwise known as VIP. <laughs> 10 thousands. Yes, yes. And that caters for food and drinks. Everything. You don't think it now you pay 10,000 and then now you'll still be mm. given a manual. No. Everything is inside. And it's not a Eat. single cost meal. It's three cost meals. It's a three cost meals. And it's a soup. Yeah. I love the Full, full. Full, full. Okay. So earlier in the morning, we talked about the guests who will be joining us at 8 a.m. And we said, if you look in the country, you'll see uh, in terms of Mobile coverage almost kill a mali Kenya. Eko nini? Eko mtandao. Yes, sim. In some of these areas, it's because of a certain fund. If you go to many parts of this country, you'll find that you have access to television and services. It's also in some respect thanks to this fund. It's called the Universal Service Fund, administered by the Communication Authority. And the person who's the boss of the the director is Christopher Kamei. He's our guest for the next hour. Christopher, good morning. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. That's Thank a hot seat of the Situation Room. Thank you. Now, the Communication Authority is our regulator. So many times, if you're someone by the Communication Authority, you go and Oh, Najua. Sasa umejileta hapa. Thank you. <laughs> City will begin with giving you the day's proverb. Every week, City goes to one African country. He mines proverbs from that country, and then he gives us a proverb a day from that country. Your job, Bonakeme, is to listen to the proverb and give us your interpretation of the proverb. He is supported by EcoBank, the Pan-African Bank. It says what? We, you, A better you, you? a better me. Yeah. A better, a better Africa. Africa. There's a song mm. for everything. Mm. Tomorrow will be mm. better you, better me. So, mm. Echo Bank. <laughs> Echo Bank has 35, has representation in 35 African countries. Majority, right? And uh, making transactions easier. So imagine if you were in Kenya today mm -hmm. and then you were going to work in another country, pick a place. I don't know. Cameroon. Oh, is that not where you were going? Rwanda. Okay, fine. <coughs> Rwanda. We can go to Rwanda. Echo Bank would be there. So you don't have to shut down your accounts and say, okay, I'm going to start again. No. You go to Rwanda and you pick up where you left off because yeah. Echo Bank's presence there allows you to do just that. It's a pan-African bank and saying, you know what? Transactions is one of the things in life that should actually be made seamless. And they've gone ahead to do that. So representation in 35 African countries, 14,000 employees, as well as four more countries outside of Africa, making it better for you and easier for you to transact. A better you, a better Africa. Kabisa. Mm. City. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Where in Africa are you this week? We are in the Republic of Angola. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get tired of saying this. Mm -hmm. The seventh largest country in Africa. Mm -hmm. By geography Landmass. or population? Economy. No, you two excuse me. <laughs> when you told something, just okay. take the information you've been given and leave it there. Okay. Okay. Let me repeat it. Seventh largest <laughs> country in Africa. Do you have anything else to ask me? No, please. Eric? No. Thank you very much. Now, let's go on. Mm. <laughs> the real journey of discovery begins in old age. The real journey of discovery begins in old age. Yes. Christopher, what's your interpretation of this one? It's about wisdom, I think. Um, the older you are, the wiser you are, <clears throat> the more, you know, reflective of things and proper contextualization of life. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. I'm inclined to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> Just admit it. Uh, you know, I'm inclined to agree with him <laughs> because <laughs> he has put it very, very well. Mm. Yes. Mm. Thank you. You relate. No, I relate perfectly. Mm. And don't introduce insinuations, and, uh, Eric. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> just ask him. Just mm. saying. I'm just saying. No, I have to say this, uh, though. Uh, I have met people who are my age, my contemporaries, mm. some who are older. Who, even if I stretched my imagination and tried, I really wouldn't call wise. Cookie cutter way of making people really seem very stupid. But there it is. They're not really many, but they exist. Their old age hasn't started. They're still young. There's a delay, but you know what you came. Bonakebe. Please tell us, what is the Universal Service Fund? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, uh, uh, let me indicate that uh, the, the Universal Service Fund was um, a fund created um, in realization that uh, the efforts that, uh, not just in Kenya, the efforts that uh, various governments um, were making in terms of um, rolling out or ensuring that communication services are available to all citizens um, by way of, you know, using government machinery mm. and government entities uh, was not working. At least the speed at which um, that was being achieved was extremely, extremely low. Mm. So that is why in the 90s, um, there was a deliberate effort to undertake liberalization, meaning introducing the private sector to leverage on the private capital uh, to um, <clears throat> take that uh, journey forward. Um, but you, you and me, um, you know that the private sector would be choosy. They mm. would go to places where, of course, they would make money. Um, there would be return on investment. But the reality on the ground uh, with respect to, you know, our geographical, you know, situation, you know, economic situation of our people, um, you know, leads to a situation where some people will be left behind. Mm. Um, because, um, f you know, private capital and private operators will always um, only go to the extent to which uh, they can make money. Um, so in 2009, <clears throat> um, just like many other, you know, countries in the world, um, decided, uh, government decided to set up a uh, universal service fund. Um, this fund primarily was, as the name suggests, um, was meant to, you know, um, catalyze the provision and extension of communication services to unserved and underserved areas and communities. Mm. So really that is the purpose of the fund um, in, in general. When mm. you say communication services, what exactly do we mean? Now, what we mean by communication services uh, is just by um, way of saying, nowadays we call it ICT. Now they span from the one, the most unlikely, which is uh, postal and courier, for example, is a mm. communication service. Mm -hmm. um, broadcasting being um, TV or radio mm. is a communication service. 
course, telecommunications is a communication service, and there are many varieties or sub sub um, telecommunication services, for example. Most people nowadays talk about the internet, that is the voice, data, you know, video, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, all those fall under uh, telecommunications um, uh, services. Um, mm -hmm. And um, just to indicate that these services are provided to, through various platforms, uh, some of them ranging from satellite communication, um, others through cable, others through terrestrial uh, wireless communication systems as well as uh, wireline communication services. Um, okay. Yeah. When an investor has been licensed to operate in the country in any of these areas that you've talked about, yeah. as a courier operator, postal, uh, in broadcasting, in ICT, in mobile telephony, they're expected to come and invest yeah. in the areas that they're operating in. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. If you give us a license, I come to the communication authority today and you give me a license for radio, I'm expected to invest yeah. in my transmission equipment to make sure that then I reach out the areas. So at what point does the Universal Service Fund determine the areas that are likely to be un, uh, not covered yeah. and those areas that are going to be covered? So let's start from the licensing. <coughs> okay. You know, when um, we grant you a license, and these, I'm talking about licenses that have uh, limitations in terms of the number of licensees that can be in the market. And these limitations arise uh, mainly because of the spectrum um, limitations. Because, uh, you know, spectrum is, is limited, it is finite. Um, so it can only take, a, you know, you know, a number of licensees. Mm. So in that context, and for purposes of ensuring that uh, those benefiting from these, um, these uh, few opportunities mm. um, to access spectrum, mm. um, are then, you know, in terms of introducing them to the market, they're introduced through a competitive process, uh, both in terms of what you offer as rollout, mm obligations in other words what you what you do in simple terms you say i want to operate um, in your market <clears throat> i have financial resources to this extent uh, what you'd expect from me in the next couple of years is xyz in mm -hmm. terms of rich mm -hmm. in terms of subscription in terms of you know quality of service in terms of even pricing and so on so you will then be taken through uh, what we call a beauty contest. Mm. And that mm. beauty contest is a mainly just a comparison between the various offers on the table, mm. um, uh, taking into account what I just indicated in terms of what we call rollout obligations, mm. geographical and subscriber rollout obligations. That's where we began. Mm. Now, these rollout obligations are then uh, based on who provides the best um, you know, offer is given the opportunity to, grant, to be granted the license. And uh, subsequent to that, then there would be negotiations on, on, on just to try to stretch this, this, um, these commitments uh, to the extent possible so that uh, we see how we can achieve uh, universal access as quickly as possible. But there is an extent to which you can go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and this extent, as I said, is really motivated by, um, you know, a give and take in terms of you know, you are telling me to go to this particular place. There are no people. I cannot make money there. Mm. So there is that give and take. Then we will have that negotiation and say, look, but when you go to Mombasa, you'll make a bit more money. Mm. You can use that money to, you to know, invest here. To invest in that, you know, those kind of discussions then uh, take place. At the end of that, of course, um, and after ex exhausting our the, those opportunities of of of, uh, of using uh, you know private capital, um, would remain areas that that would never be covered, mm -hmm. um, either through this you know arrangement of the license or their own volution in terms of just expanding their network. Um, and as I said earlier, this is where really the Universal Service Fund comes in, mm -hmm. um, so that we are able to uh, find another or rather use another intervention to be able to ensure uh, those gaps that are left behind um, are covered. Okay. So, I mean, 
I think you may have alluded to it, but obviously it's a fund. So that means that there's money in it. Yeah. Where does that money come, come from? Now, this money comes from licensees. They come from the, you know, the operators. Um, everyone who has a license is obligated to pay 0.5% uh, of their gross annual turnover mm -hmm. to the fund. Um, so that is really the source of, of the fund. However, <coughs> the law that establishes the fund also provides an opportunities uh, to source for funding from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, parliament can decide to appropriate, um, you know, uh, in the budget mm -hmm. um, an amount. It hasn't happened yet, but that opportunity is there. There is also the opportunity of sourcing from, from you know, grants, from donations, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, by and large, so far, we've uh, really only relied on the contributions from the industry players. You know, the <coughs> something that I've always found a mystery is this concept of broadcast. Mm. I mean, it's been explained to me how it is that it works, how we are now in this studio, we are talking, and we can be heard all over the globe or we can be seen. But what I'm interested in is when people come to, say, the Communication Authority for La Sencia, this license, what exactly are they looking for? What is it that that license entails? The license is simple. It's in two parts. <clears throat> One, it gives you the, the legal um, space to, to be able to operate mm. in, in, in the market. Mm. Because the law says that if you have to provide communication services, mm. you can only do it through a license. So there is a, there is a compliance issue, a legal compliance issue. Mm. Now, in terms of the true nature of the license, mm. the license has what we call terms and conditions. Mm. Terms and conditions are a set of rules, the do's and don'ts. Um, like, for example, you must act in a certain manner. You mm -hmm. must, um, you know, follow these procedures in terms of submitting your returns, in terms of acting within the market, you know, the, you know, fair, fair competition issues and so on. Um, compliance to standards because standards are required uh, whether it's equipment standards or operating standards uh, quality of service requirements you know all those is, is a raft of um, um, terms and conditions which conditions are then monitored on a regular basis to ensure that uh, <coughs> you are within uh, that space um, because it's possible as a broadcaster for example to to be granted a license and then you become rock. In mm. other words, you say, for example, you start broadcasting inappropriate content. Mm. You start acting in a manner that uh, you know you you know you inc incite men, for example. So those conditions are very important, you know, in order to ensure that you are within you know the allowable uh, space uh, with respect to broadcasting. Of course, the other things is about you know. How much are you going to pay uh, for these? To what extent are you going to access? Maybe say spectrum resources if it is, you know, maybe it's a <coughs> if it's a, a, a system that uses uh, frequencies um, and so on and so forth. So generally, really, this is the whole license is and encompasses the entire operating framework mm. and um, reporting and compliance requirements um, of. A particular entity in that field. Yeah. Let me ask a simple question. Yeah. If let's say, for instance, I wanted yeah. a radio license, correct? Okay. Yeah. How difficult or how easy is it for me to get one? What am I required to do beyond presenting myself and saying I want a license? I think the most challenging thing is the availability of the resource. As you said, it's a radio license, right? Mm -hmm. So radio, say FM radio, for example, is. Uh, Pretty much, pretty much de uh, dependent on on, on spectrum. Mm. If if you ask for an FM, you know, license, uh, FM radio license in Nairobi now, it would probably be almost impossible to get because there are no frequencies. Um, so that is the first, you know, limitation. It is the resource that you need, which is limited in nature, as I said initially. Uh, 
other than that, if you take, for example, if you wanted to provide, uh, uh, you know, radio services, FM radio in, let me take an example with caution, say Marsabit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not saying uh, that there are no constraints there. I'm only saying... As an example. As mm -hmm. an example, chances are that uh, we have not fully exhausted the, the frequencies uh, for Mars a bit. Mm. Then the process becomes fairly straightforward. Uh, all you need to do is just apply, you know, apply for the license, ensure that your documentations are in place, you have produced all your, you know, you know all the required... Uh, registration, you know, tax compliance issues and everything else. And if there are no competing or there is nobody else who has expressed interest, you will just get the license uh, straightforward. Um, yes, so it's as simple mm. as that, but also as complicated as that in the sense that in some <laughs> areas, um, in most areas actually at the moment, FM to get an FM license is not it's not that we are denying a license, just mm. that there is no space to operate. Mm. There are no frequencies available. Yeah. But technologies have come into place where, as you are aware, for example, when it comes to, to, to um, digital TV, mm -hmm. we have expanded the space because, because of the digital migration. Mm. So now there are much more opportunities um, to, to, to get a license. It's almost like a walk-in, walk-out uh, space. So with respect to FM as well, we are moving into that space fairly, fairly soon. Okay. Yeah. Back to the fund. Can you give us an example of what <coughs> the fund has financed and the impact that has, that has had on a community? Um, uh, thank you for that question. The, the, the fund, um, we started um, really, although we were ex the fund was established in 2009, we had a lot of teaching problems initially, mm. but um, by 2015, 2016, thereabouts, uh, is when we really started embarking on um, uh, implementing the fund. And uh, the starting point in, 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 in a journey uh, of, of uh, closing access gaps is to fa first, firstly find out where we are. Mm. You know, to what extent are we covered or not covered? So we did um, what we call an assessment of the country in 2016. And uh, <clears throat> out of that assessment, uh, you know, there are about 6,000, I think 6,612 mm. sublocations in this country because that is the smallest unit that... Uh, that uh, uh, in terms of administrative units in mm. this country. So we count our successes based on, you know, sublocations. Sub okay. So that assessment told us that about 450 sublocations um, had completely no coverage. Of what? In terms of, uh, you know, communication services, mm. uh, mobile communication services okay. uh, specifically. Um, and the other thing that we also um, realized, of course, which was monumental but still an opportunity, was connectivity to schools. And, and the reason I'm saying all this is then just to explain that the first project that we, we did, or the first two projects that we, we, we <coughs> deployed using the fund, mm. Was uh, establishment of mobile communication services in an unserved and deserved countries. That was phase one. Mm -hmm. um, the target at that particular time was to to quickly cover seventy eight sublocations that were completely no communication. Mm -hmm. As in, if you get bitten by a snake, or you are in really big trouble, it will probably take you days to get rescued. Mm -hmm. Uh, so our priority was those 78, and we started those uh, in 2016-2017. Mm. And I'm glad to say out of the 78 um, sublocations, we have covered 76 completely. The, the, the two are challenges. But when you say completely, yes, we're talking about you have mobile... Services in services connect, yes. Co yes. connected. Yes. All, op all licensed operators? 
uh, by and large all licensed operators yes okay yeah 2G, 3G, 4G? So we started with 2G and what happens in communication services, services generally as technology moves, we started with 2G. All those applications have been um, migrated from 2G and leapfrogged actually from 2G to 4G mm. um, because um, uh, 4G came at the right time for this country. Um, some, you know, there were a few 3G areas, but we, we leapfrogged to, to 4G. Okay. So, um, the other important thing to say uh, in terms of our objective was in two parts. One, to ensure those sub-locations, 80% of the population in those sub-locations are covered. And a minimum of 60% of geographical coverage. Mm. Um, because these areas were really very remote areas. Um, <clears throat> there, there are areas where maybe a whole sublocation has, in some cases, only two people. <laughs> and it is probably the size <laughs> of a, a county in some areas. Mm. <laughs> and it's a sublocation. Mm. You know, there are sublocations that are bigger than, bigger than Kiambu County. And it's a sublocation. And it is a sublocation. There are some, some even worse. I think some you can, you can travel from morning to evening uh, before reaching the other end. And, and probably in the course of that, you, you, the only thing that, that you've seen alive is, is a wild animal. Where? In uh, this country? Yes. Let's take a break. We'll come back shortly. 25 minutes to nine. Christopher Kame is the director of the Universal Service Fund of the Communication Authority of Kenya. We are unpacking this fund, getting to understand it, and then also seeking accountability for it. How much has been put into this fund? How much has been spent? In what? And do we see value for it? The people of Taptengale, we are talking about this now. Finya Finya computer. Got it. Where are you? Comfuko. This is the situation. Yeah, yeah, I'm still having a good day, Taisha. Yeah. yeah. And uh, meeting your mutual. Uh-huh. I love for Nicole it a day. Oh. Eh. Uh, Muga. <laughs> <laughs> CT Lodge. Uh, Muga. <laughs> Muga, not Muga. Get the VIP treatment with Maramoja Transport. Your ride, your choice. Meet your favorite driver again and again. Use the pair button to connect with your personal driver. Experience personalized service with Maramoja Transport, your trusted companion on every journey. Yeah, yeah, I'm still having a good day, Taisha. Yeah. 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 And uh, meeting your uh -huh. I love for Nicole today. Oh. Uh, Get the VIP treatment with Maramoja Transport. Your ride, your choice. Meet your favorite driver again and again. Use the pair button to connect with your personal driver. Experience personalized service with Maramoja Transport. Your trusted companion on every journey.
let this third wheel ruin date night. Go show him who's the boss. Or maybe not. Bing bang bing. Bum bum. Hi, Tim Wills. Here to review this uh, masterpiece. This is a cocktail of engines. This is our history. This is our heritage. I got stuck in the mud. So, and I was alone, so I had to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? These cars are horsepower of around 585 to 625 horsepower. Communication authority, uh, Christopher has explained to us, you know what, at the communication authority, you look at communication in its entirety, in its spectrum, and you want every part of this country to be covered, that there is going to be internet connectivity in every corner, every village in the country. Every village can have access to radio services, to TV, to postal services, to courier services, and even every police station shall have access to Ova Ova. <laughs> they can do <laughs> Ova Ova, they can communicate. Can get it now. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where the service, the Universal Service Fund also now plays a part in making sure that this is covered, right? Um, let's talk about internet connectivity. Uh, this is big. The government is saying, all right, so we are spreading uh, the fiber optic cable countrywide. We are doing this and the other. If we look at that alone, has the Universal Service Fund financed the rollout of fiber optic in a country? Since when? For how long? How much? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Latif. <clears throat> um, let me start by saying the majority of Kenyans access the internet um, through the mobile wireless systems, mm. um, as you know that very well. Yeah. The advent of you know broadband wireless has given us a very big opportunity to be able to get to the internet uh, in, in a very... Um, and that is why our emphasis all along has been to promote you know wireless access but we have gotten to <clears throat> a space where we want to ensure that institutions which is um, you know talk of um, hospitals schools um, and other big big institutions we cannot rely on the broadband wireless uh, we need wireline 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 um, internet connectivity mm. So um, last year we entered into partnership with the ICT authority <coughs> uh, with a view to supporting government uh, to, to roll out the targeted 100,000 kilometers of, of fiber optic cable throughout the country. Our contribution basically um, based on um, what we could, we did um, you know, offer to spend 5 billion shillings to roll out uh, fiber optic uh, uh, connectivity that is estimated to be 2,500 kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, of course, considering that that um, funding came from the fund, the Universal Service Fund, mm. we did emphasize that our contribution should concentrate on the most unserved and underserved counties. Mm. So we selected 19 of them for purposes of benefiting from, from that program. So the 2,500 kilometers of fiber cable is uh, really going to be rolled out in those far-flanked uh, areas of the country. Um, we selected the most needy um, counties uh, and the reason is that we know the other counties that are that are, you know, like, you know, Nairobi, where it's heavily populated, mm. the private sector can easily 
can easily come in and uh, uh, roll out this infrastructure uh, because it makes uh, it makes uh, commercial sense. But in our case, in realization of that, mm. we have committed five billion um, to to deploy these two thousand mm. five hundred kilometers. And it's actually going to happen. And it's already happening. Okay. Yes. So what does this mean essentially? Is that the communities and people in these areas then will have access essentially to the internet? Absolutely. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Now. Um, looking at the readiness and the added infrastructure that is ready, because you know how they say you can lay a pipe, but you know, is it con what is it connected to? Yeah. Um, is that taken into consideration as well to say that, look, yeah, we're making sure that this fiber optic is available here, but do we run the risk of laying it there and it doesn't have the requisite infrastructure to plug it into for then to really serve the people? Does that? Yeah. Come into play? yeah, that's a very important yeah. question. Um, and and uh, we've thought through that. <clears throat> and uh, let's first of all just appreciate uh, the fact that uh, this fiber optic cable will be used by many, many, many different organizations mm. and in institutions. In fact, the biggest user initially would be the mobile operators mm. in order to carry their traffic from the, you know, the very remote areas number one. And that traffic, of course, includes the internet traffic that comes from you and me who, you know, live in those areas. Mm. Number two, we, uh, we also, in partnership with the, the ICT authority, uh, mm. are in the process of um, putting in place the infrastructure you just talked about, the, 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 the terminal equipment, the local area networks, say, for example, within hospitals uh, in those areas, the schools in those areas, um, government institutions. So there's a separate program to, that has been running uh, that, that ensures the terminal equipment will be in place as and when this cable arrives. So that then they just meet at that point, mm -hmm. as you said, mm. and then the service is then uh, being uh, provided end to end. Mm. Uh, yes, so we have other programs, as I said, that uh, then, you know, I'd, you know speak to to just what you just said. Okay. Yeah. So not looking at just then looking at the fund generally and saying the different projects that you enter into, what would you say is a success rate if you're going to go from one to ten, in this case ten being the highest. Um, it's interesting when you ask people to rate themselves, but okay. Um, in terms of success, yeah. the money because this is money that is available from the different places that it comes from, one would assume it's quite a happy chunk of money. Um, and then what it is actually meant to do. What would you rate success? And how can we actually see and say, absolutely, yes, this is a project started by the fund, um, money that comes from licenses and can be used for certain things. How would you say that it's been actually been able to incorporate into society and is actually working and that the fund is behind certain initiatives that are working yeah. today? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, in terms of the, the success um, the success rate, I can start by saying already about 750,000 Kenyans, as we speak, have benefited in terms of the initiatives that we've been running. Mm -hmm. Our target is 1.7 million. Mm -hmm. And we have specific programs that I'd, I'd started uh, talking about that, uh, mm -hmm. phase one. We, have that, we are in phase two and phase three. And as we speak, we are formulating phase four with a view to starting it from July this year. Um, <clears throat> so I want to you know, measure success in terms of what... what, what the what, number of people in impacted. In terms of the number of people that have been impacted. Mm. The one... 0.7 million people that I'm talking about are the people that represent 3.6% of the population, mm. which, as we speak, is completely not um, addressed, as in completely. Mm. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the project success, of course, um, we are dealing with very difficult circumstances areas. I can give you an example that since 2015, 2016, there is an area that we have tried to address and up to the day we've not been able to succeed. Why? Many reasons. One area was just too insecure. As in, you just can't go there. Um, and 
we've been advised as such never to step there at this point in time. And the situation has been the same. To the extent that we had to, you know, declare force major yeah. Since 2015. Since 2015. There is another um, area in uh, a sub certain sublocation called Lopet in West Pokot that has also been problematic because the community are unable to agree, one, where we should put the infrastructure. What's, what's the contention here? Uh, the contention is oftentimes when you go to these areas, mm. um, it is the chiefs that determine where you need to be. Yeah. And sometimes politics sets in and there are some people against the chief, others are pro the chief, because they, they anticipate that if you put an installation in a particular place, there will be some benefit. There, yeah. there will be lease issues. In mm. some cases, mm. they argue amongst themselves who should collect the, the lease, you know, how will it be shared. Those mundane things actually manifest itself in a way that you can't move. And the administrative officers have not been able to resolve this. We have done engagements after engagements. Oftentimes, when we do the engagement, we are given assurance that uh, it has been resolved. Um, when you go back and try to remobilize, you then find that apparently the issue has not been resolved. So, but we are working very closely with the with the government to see that the, the, these uh, areas are, are resolved. Now, back to your question, um, success rate. What would seven? Let me just take one example. What mm. would seventy six over seventy eight? What in terms of percentage that would be what? Wow. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> That's a good percent. Mm. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the other project that we ran <coughs> was connecting eight hundred and eighty six uh, schools with the broadband internet, mm. um, and that was a trial. And it was based on schools that were e-ready at that particular time. Mm -hmm. E-ready meaning they had what they needed, yes. they just needed the connection. Absolutely, okay. that's, that's the meaning. Okay. They had computer labs, for mm -hmm. example, they had a teacher that, uh, and they, were, they had examinable uh, courses on uh, IT. Mm. And with the help of the Minister of Education, they gave us a list. And when we subjected this list, lead, uh, list through our, the criteria, that uh, the e-readiness criteria, we picked 886 and we connected all of them. Mm -hmm. That's another 100% um, success. Mm -hmm. However, <coughs> we have challenges of sustainability. Uh, the fund is not created to sustain. The fund is created to deploy. Mm. Deploy and move on. Other people will take over the issues of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Who? The beneficiaries. For example, the, the broadband for schools, um, the anticipation as it was being, as we were deploying, was that it will t be taken over either by the Ministry of Education or by the schools themselves. Mm. Um, unfortunately, that as is still a pending issue mm -hmm. um, that, that, that is still being addressed. Uh, so, in, in other words, what I'm trying to say, sometimes sustainability tends to worry us sometimes. Do you think that if your mandate was widened to the sustainability aspect, that the fund would then be willing to go into that? I remember that as comms people, we are taught that communication is only complete when you get feedback, feedback. Yes. right? So, um, would you think that, because you can provide it, you know, but how do you, are you sure that this thing that you are providing is actually making a difference or having the impact that it was yeah. initially designed to? Uh, because it's almost, it almost sounds as if, well, you know, we're going to lay the thing and leave it there, whether it's used or not. Well, our mandate doesn't quite get there. Do you think that it would be more impactful if your mandate was widened to ensure sustainability? I, I really don't even think it is an issue of the mandate that is a problem. The issue is the capacity of the fund, the size of the fund um, compared to the needs mm. um, is far too small. 
to take over sustainability for every project that we undertake. If we were to do sustainability... This fund is collecting about 2 billion shillings every year, isn't it? Yes. And you're saying and, and, that is not sufficient? Not and, 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 and you know the amount of money required to, 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 to just close the gaps, leave, leave alone sustainability, is mm -hmm. huge. It's huge. Um, for example, for the, the, the example I have given for schools, just the less than a thousand schools mm. um, in a year, it needed uh, over a billion shillings to sustain. How much was it to install yeah. in this 856 schools? Uh, 850 costed us um, about... Let me just be sure that I'm correct with that figure. Um, in total, we it cost us, costed us uh, about slightly over 800 million. Okay. okay. 800 million to install this, yeah. right? And by your own admission, you're not really sure today if all those 856 schools are actually using... Yeah. this thing that you installed. Yeah. So would it make sense to even say, can we reduce the number that we're installing for, yeah. but ensure that there is impact and use of this thing that we have laid? Because sure. the next thing would be, you would speculate and say, well, then that was a waste of 800 million shillings. If you're not sure that, they're actually using it. So what if you'd said, around the 47 counties in the country, we're going to pick 10 schools. Mm -hmm. Install, make sure that they can use it and ensure sustainability. Yeah. Does that make some kind of sense? It makes a lot of sense. And in fact, that is the thinking right now. <clears throat> I think the question for the schools was really um, a teething problem because um, there was a clear understanding in the beginning mm. that we were going to do it in partnership. There's an end user. Yeah, there's an end user. But I think I still like you for that because your job is to provide the connectivity. And then there's an end user who takes it up. If the Ministry of Education is involved in this, these are school, they are the ones who are then to provide the learning materials through the infrastructure, they should be the ones who take it up. It cannot be that now you are running an entire network here of school programs and the school just turns up, I mean the Ministry of Education just turns up. I, I can see the argument on both sides. On one, on one hand, because you're piloting, you've got to be accountable. You cannot be telling us that you spent, you know, 800 million shillings to roll out to this number of schools and then we go to those schools and we find, yeah, there's a cable, there's a terminal, but the children who've been in that school in the last three years have don't even know anything about internet. You know, as you're speaking, mm. I'm thinking about the cabling and then I'm relating it to roads because it's a pathway. And I'm looking at an argument that has been made for the longest time that over the time in the history of this country, you'll find that there are places where roads are built and what people use those roads for is for drying maize. Mm. Okay? And yet... When you look at what those roads do in terms of simply opening up that space, because the roads don't end there. Yeah. They connect the place to other, uh, to other destinations. Yep. And then it may not happen immediately, but it makes it possible for people in that area to actually have access and to interact with things that ordinarily they would never have been able to access or relate to. In the same way, I'm thinking of when a new road is built and the impact it has on the businesses in certain areas. Yep. You see, most people think that this Limuru road is an old road. It's actually the new road. The old road used to go through the escarpment and then through Naivasha. Mm -hmm. Now, when that new road was built, business in Naivasha more or less died completely. It was revived when the flower, uh, flower farms came, came up. up. So, in many ways, I think, even when you lay that network, at the time of laying it, it may seem obsolete, obsolete and useless. But it is the beginning of something that, yes, indeed, those people have never, never, never experienced and never expected to experience. But 
If the next step can be, how then do you get them to utilize something that has already been put in place? Because ordinarily, that is something they would never have expected to, uh, to receive mm. and they wouldn't know even how to start imagining that they would get it. Good argument, City. It's like saying that you're taking power like it used to happen. Yes. You take power to the DO's home. Home. All right? <laughs> And you wonder, so why is the community not benefiting from this power? It's because you took power to the DO's home. If you take power to school, and the entire understanding is school to use it, then if the school doesn't use it, you're stuck. If you took power to the community, community. Yeah. around and, and the, the school, school received it first, yes, yes, then now everything else plays out. So what can you do about that? Make sure that, okay, so 850 schools means 850 communities mm, yeah <clears throat> so we are in discussion of course to see how this project can be sustained going forward let alone being upscaled um those issues about <clears throat> using schools as the anchor institutions for purposes of extending communication to the entire community around the school yeah. is what is now on the table so you know leveraging on um you know those extensions as you said is the, be the best way to do it and in fact that is exactly what we are doing uh, with respect to the digital superhighway uh, rollout of 2500 kilometers because we are targeting institutions mm. and and, and as, as you may have realized government is, is is also in the process of leveraging on that in setting up wireless uh, wi-fi mm. uh, for, for community purposes for markets mm. and so on yeah and tap thing lays to your youth Yes. To Finya Finya Computer okay. from the local computer hubs. Thank you very much, boss, for joining us. This is Christopher Keme. He's the director of the Universal Service Fund of the Communication Authority of Kenya. He's been our guest talking about this fund. And now we understand it a bit better. Keep it here for more, 9 a.m. Spice up your life.